This Sunday's image of the life the risen Christ shares with us is the image of friendship. We are called to serve others as Jesus came to serve, but for John's gospel, the image of servanthood is too hierarchical, too distant to capture the essence of life with Christ. Good morning and welcome to worship on Sunday, May 9th, 2021. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of the First Lutheran Church mothers and mothers everywhere. I hope you have a blessed, great day. I would like to add Kurt Wiedenkeller and a friend of his to our prayer list. Kurt is the brother of Keith Wiedenkeller and he and his friend were pretty severely injured in an accident that happened during this past week. So please keep Kurt, his family, and his friend in your prayers. Um, I would also like to remind everyone to make sure you check those emails we send out every week. It's all the news of what's going on here at First Lutheran Church. So if you're not getting those emails, let me know at dudley at firstlutheranKC.com. We've been having some lovely outdoor services in the front on the front steps at the church. Would love to see you join us for those if you feel safe and are able to do that. Um, we will be letting you know soon when indoor services may begin happening again. So I hope you all have a great week. Enjoy the service and we will see you soon. Welcome to worship for this sixth Sunday of Easter. We continue with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. 
O God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the 10th chapter of Acts. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water? for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The Word of the Lord. Today's psalm is Psalm 98. Sing a new song to the Lord who has done marvelous things, whose right hand and holy arm have won the victory. O Lord, you have made known your victory, you have revealed your righteousness in the sight of the nations. You remember your steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of song. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, Shout with joy before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell therein. 
Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord, who comes to judge the earth. The Lord will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. The second reading is from the fifth chapter of 1 John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. The word of the Lord. The gospel reading is from the 15th chapter of John. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As I looked at the lessons assigned for today, there was one verse from each of the three that leapt to my attention. And as I read them, it seemed to me more and more that these three verses taken together offer us a kind of prescription, an antidote for the troubles of our times. Our relationships with people who are different from us are too often defined by tribalism and intolerance. We will exclude or ignore people because of where they come from, what religion they are, their political opinions, and for many other flimsy reasons. We have a disjointed sense of freedom. In an effort to be independent, we try to be God. Only the things that we come up with are not as wise, and our life suffers. And perhaps worse, we don't know what love is. We relegate it to a pleasant feeling while all the things around us that need real love to survive crumble. It seems like a bleak picture, but there are alternatives. And the first comes from our reading from Acts. And it comes to us as a question. Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? This, of course, takes place in that most amazing of stories, which is the backdrop for the inclusion of all the Gentiles into God's fold. The question still existed at this point in the story of the gospel of what the coming of Jesus meant for the Gentiles. For so many generations, the difference between Jew and Gentile was the difference that made a difference. But here, as early as Acts chapter 10 even the language describing these two groups is beginning to change. No longer is it Jew and Gentile, but circumcised and uncircumcised believers. Belief is what becomes the emphasis rather than bloodline. While Peter was still speaking the story of Jesus, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, irrespective of where they were from or to whom they were related, and then comes that wonderful question, who can withhold the water? It's a question which acknowledges that what is happening in that room is God's action, God's initiative to make for himself a large and diverse family. The question acknowledges the audacity it would take to refuse baptismal waters for they from whom God had not withheld the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The audacity of acknowledging a barrier between people which God himself does not acknowledge. We are at our worst as human beings when we look at each other through the lens of labels. Labels of ethnicity, politics, religion, and nation. Samuel Johnson once wrote that whoever makes a beast of himself gets rid of the pain of being a man. And so perhaps it's also true that he who makes a beast of other men or diminishes them to labels with no humanity unburdens himself of the responsibility of treating them as fellow human beings. 
Once you label me, you negate me, is a quote attributed to the theologian Soren Kierkegaard. And yet, into the very home of otherness, the house of Cornelius, the Gentile, walks Peter and his comrades to see with their own eyes that God does not honor the divisions of humankind. The Spirit fell on them just as it did on us. Who can withhold the waters? No one who has seen that God shows no partiality. In our second reading, we hear that the commandments of God are not burdensome. And that simple statement points us to a beautiful truth. At first, it seems contradictory. Isn't every commandment burdensome? Isn't anything that would impose itself on my free will burdensome? But the truth is, it is our wills that are the problem. Our wills are fallen. Not everything that occurs to us to think and to do is good. When is a commandment not burdensome? When it shows us who we really are. Shows us what we're truly made to do. Sin is the aberration. Sin is that which is against our God-given nature. Following God's commandments is not burdensome because it's what we were made for. God commands the birds to fly and the fish to swim and the wild horses to run. And God's creatures don't find these things burdensome because God has uniquely equipped them for these functions. Indeed, even in these lower creatures, one can sense a certain joy that they take in doing what God has made them to do. And so it is with us. The burden of humanity is that we're so smart, we can imagine doing things that are completely out of whack with who we are and then to carry out those imaginations, no matter how foreign they are to our identity. We can conceive of hate, jealousy, bitterness, violence, apathy, greed, and we can live held back by these things. But it is they which are the burden on our life, not God's commandments. Not the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which are the fruits of the Spirit, and the fingerprint of God upon our own natures. The commandments of God, which are not burdensome, because they are who we are, and the fruit which God has asked us to produce in the world. In our gospel, we hear Jesus say that he is giving these commandments so that we will love one another. C.S. Lewis wrote that love is not an affectionate feeling. As he was writing this, he surely meant that love is not just an affectionate feeling because we know that feelings of love for spouse and parents, friends, family, and church is one of the great things in life. But it's good that love is more than this because our feelings are fickle. I do not always feel the way I should since I am a fallen creature. My feelings are not totally in line with my own nature as God's child or with God's word. But love is more than that, as Lewis continues. Love is the steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. When things are well, we learn this kind of love first from our mothers and fathers. And then perhaps we learn it again when we too become mothers and fathers. We find joy in our roles, but when joy fails us and is replaced with weariness, frustration, or sadness, love is still there as the steady wish and work for the good of our children. And it is that kind of love that Jesus wishes for his church among us. Not a fickle love that disperses at the first sign of trouble or bad feelings or difference of opinion, but an abiding, constant, steady wish and work for the other's ultimate good. The love that God has for us and calls us to have for one another. Observe no barrier between people that God does not. Know who you are, a child of God made for good works, and know love as the steady wish and work for the good of the other, and do what you can to bring that into the world. Do these things and you become a part of the healing that our day needs in the name of Jesus Christ. May the joy that you find in doing them 
become for you the evidence that God is and that God has spoken to the glory of the Father Almighty. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God now and forever. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us now bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving God, you call us to be your fruit-bearing church. Strengthen the bonds among all Christian churches. Today we pray for the Moravian Church, giving thanks for the life and witness of Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, renewer of the church and hymn writer. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Creating God, the earth praises you, the seas roar and the hills sing for joy. Fill the earth with your love so that by their song all creatures of land and sea and sky, burrowing and soaring, may call us to join with them in praise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Faithful Savior, you conquer the world not with weapons but with undying love. Plant your word in the hearts of the nation's leaders and give them your spirit so that the peoples of the world may live in peace. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Caring healer, you forget no one and accompany the lonely. Be present with those who are sick or suffering, especially all those we now name, aloud or in our hearts. Provide for those needing homes or medical care and point us towards life-changing responses to these needs in our communities. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Gracious God, as a mother comforts her child, you comfort us. Bless mothers and mothering people in our lives. Comfort those who miss their mothers, mothers who grieve, those who grieve because they cannot be mothers, and those who have never known a loving mother. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Gentle Redeemer, all who die in you abide in your presence forever. We remember with thanksgiving those who have shared your love throughout their lives. Keep us united with them in your lasting love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, 
we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Now let us pray using the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus. The God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace to share the good news. Thanks be to God.